What's up everybody? This is the Act Man here, and today I'm finally going to talk about the thing you've all been waiting for. Without further ado, let's get into why was Halo 3's campaign so awesome? You've got mail. Well, well it looks like I got an email. Well, let's let's check this out real quick. Huh, a gift from the Microsoft store. Well, let's open it. No, it's not true. It's impossible. No! So if it wasn't obvious from that intro, let me boldly state, I did not buy Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA. I did not plan on getting it ever or making a review on it. This is the type of product that is bad for everyone involved. The more people buy it, the more likely this hobby and passion we all share will continue to go down the shitter. Is this good for the player? I am thankful that someone gifted me a game. It's the gesture that matters. But goddammit, I still feel some guilt. Although you know what? This is perfect, because I can actually tell you every single way they managed to fuck this game up. And the few things they did right. I can get it all out there. Just to get you to understand the massive disappointment and downward spiral the Battlefront series has gone through, let's relive the build-up to this abomination. If you watched my video on the classic Battlefront 2, then you know I'm a huge fan of the series, and Star Wars in general. So after hearing Battlefront was getting rebooted, and a new game was coming out after a decade of nothing, I was hyped as could be. However, the dark side of the Force clouded EA and DICE's vision. It was obvious this new Battlefront would be nothing like the games we love, and would have almost none of the features and content that gave the Battlefront series its reputation, so I passed on it. We all eagerly awaited that glorious return, because all I've wanted since I was 12 years old was a cutting-edge, modern iteration of Battlefront 2. Just another game to let me relive those great childhood memories, but with improvements made to every aspect of the game. Lo and behold, it seemed I was getting my wish. Battlefront 2? But it's going to have content? Single player campaign? Space battles? The fucking Clone Wars? I couldn't believe it. All those years of waiting, all the franchises I've loved that never got a truly good sequel, that never got to fulfill their destinies, Battlefront would be revived better than ever. Or so, we all thought. And that's where we are today. Ten years of waiting, followed by one catastrophic disappointment after another. The trust, love, and hope fans had for this series was violated and destroyed in only two years. But I'm not gonna get into the whole loot box fiasco again. I already said my piece on that. There's only one thing to do now, and that's to see what this game is really about. Is it as bad as the Metacritic ratings would have us believe? Was all that commotion over loot boxes just a bunch of hyperbole? Or has Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA utterly fallen to the dark side? Well, let's buy some loot boxes, buy some loot boxes, and buy some loot boxes straight into this. This game deservedly got a bad rap for the stunt EA tried to pull, but, and I'm gonna try really hard to do this, I wanna go in with an open mind. Clear your mind must be. Well, it didn't take long for the game to make me jaded, because like other diarrhea-infested games made by some greedy fuck nuggets, they try to force you to accept some terms of service that probably say some bullshit along the lines of, you don't actually own this game because fuck you, sincerely EA. What the fuck is a user agreement anyways? If I bought the game, or someone bought it for me, it's mine. What in the name of Jar Jar Binks do I need to agree to? Sucking your dick, EA? Is that what you want? Yes! Cause no, I don't agree to that. Make no mistake, I really did want to love this game. But going into this, I can't lie, I'm gonna be jaded. 
when you get extensive amounts of bad press surrounding a product, us consumers can't help but think about that whenever we see or hear about your product. Well, chances are if you're a hardcore Star Wars fan like me, or even if you're on the more casual side, you were hoping that this game would have some redeeming qualities, because it can't all be bad, right? That is correct. And yeah, you're right, there is some good stuff in this game. But let me tell you, the campaign and story is not fucking one of them. So the first five seconds look promising, but then... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold the goddamn Nokia phone. Where's the opening text crawl? You know, that thing that nearly every Star Wars game from the last 15 years has had? Okay, so you know why they sing the national anthem before the Super Bowl? That's to get you hyped to watch football. Or you know how some families say a prayer before Thanksgiving dinner? That's to get you hyped for stuffing your face. In the same principle, seeing the opening crawl for a Star Wars game gets you fucking hyped to play it. But it's missing in the most graphically impressive Star Wars game to date? We're starting things off on the wrong foot. So it begins with a cutscene showing your new strong female protagonist captured on a rebel ship. There's some cliche cop interrogation dialogue and a bit of foreshadowing. It's not too bad. But like idiots who don't understand the technology of the universe they live in, for some reason they leave her helmet in the prison cell, which she uses to communicate with her droid and escape. You'd think when a group of soldiers that all wear the same helmet with some kind of communication box on the side would have the foresight to take everything but clothes out of the prison cell of a special forces imperial commander? Nah. This scene from the droid's point of view is actually pretty cool. Wish I could, but we don't have the droid's access code. Might I suggest finding the access code? HA! <laughs> GOT <Gotty! laughs> Have the rebels figured out you wanted to be caught? Never crossed their mind. Gee, this whole plan was banking on the fact that the rebels would leave your helmet in your cell? That's a pretty fucking stupid plan if you ask me. You go through a stealth section and there's a nice bit of fan service with Admiral Akbar giving a speech to some rebels. But hooey! By the end of this campaign, you will be drowning in fan service. You get a weapon, purge some data, and make your way down a single path killing everything in sight. Then Aiden bails out of the ship The Imperial ship manages to fly into just the right spot so Aiden can land on the ship. Then she takes off her helmet to remind us she's a strong female protagonist. What I will say before we go any further is, graphically speaking, this game is absolutely gorgeous. It's one of the best looking games I've ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gotten to the point where we can see the pores on a character's face. Now that's detail. So you're on the main deck, and the writers give themselves about 20 seconds to establish the relationship between these three soldiers. And they rip a page out of George Lucas's book by having them recount things they did in the past. I hope the landing wasn't too rough. Been through worse. Remember the Jabez incursion? Still haunts my dreams. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gun dogs. <laughs> Anyways, on to the second mission. Now it's important to keep in mind that I beat the campaign in 4 hours and 15 minutes. And I'm the type of guy that takes my time with the single player and tries to uncover everything. So this story is undoubtedly rushed, which you can see from the jarring transitions. Today, the rebellion dies. Sometime later? Uh, it's kind of important to know how much time later it is if right before this you say, Today, the rebellion dies. Is this all happening in the same day? Technically, Axe Man, there are no days in space since there isn't a planet with a sun that revolves. It. Shut up! And then we're on Endor? Well, this has taken place during the final battle in Return of the Jedi. Now, as much as I love the Star Wars movies, I don't really want to feel forced to refresh my memory on them when playing a new Star Wars game. It's a pitfall that some series fall into when they have such an immense, expanded universe that they feel needs to be accounted for in any new material. You didn't need to watch episode 3 or 4 to refresh your memory when you played The Force Unleashed. It certainly helps, but this is a problem Battlefront 2 has. It's trying too hard to insert itself in between the events of episodes 6, 7, and 8. And it doesn't let me focus on what I'm playing now because I don't watch those movies every day of my life. So you kill some more bad guys and 
Man, she really likes taking her helmet off, doesn't she? Well, how else is the audience supposed to know she's a strong female protagonist? And then kaboom! The Death Star explodes, which is pretty awesome. I always wanted to see how the Empire and its soldiers reacted to it, and this gives us a taste of that. However, at this point in the story, two very important flaws have become abundantly clear. Number one, the pacing of the plot. Number two, the plot itself. Look alive, agents. We can grieve later. Right now we need to move. For whatever reason, the writers deem it more important for you to continue on your mission on Endor than to spend more time addressing the destruction of the Death Star. Now your mission is to kill rebels and hijack some TIE fighters, I think. We need to reach Platform 4 and secure those TIE fighters. How did you get on Endor in the first place if you didn't have any ships? But what do you care more about as a Star Wars fan? Some ultimately pointless mission? Or would you rather see 30 more seconds of how other stormtroopers, Imperial officers, or other main characters react to the destruction of the Death Star? I understand these are special Imperial forces with a job to do, but come on. It's just more interesting to see their reactions than, uh, back to the mission, blah blah blah. What I want to point out now is Battlefront 2 has immense problems with pacing, especially cutscenes, because again, it's only four hours long. Point number two is how the plot is handled, how it's communicated to the player. You'll probably recognize this type of writing from other boring games and movies. What do we know about Argent Moon? Basically what the story of Battlefront 2 is doing is trying to explain what's going on more so than why it's going on. Like after the Death Star blows up, the rest of the mission is all just dialogue about how to get to the ships. We're gonna take back that platform and evacuate this moon. And then we're gonna make the Rebellion pay. When this opportunity should be used to flesh out why the Death Star was destroyed. Why are the characters so motivated to get to these ships? Why are they upset? What did the Death Star mean to them? These questions are much more worthwhile to answer. This could develop the characters, their motivations, desires, personalities. This game was advertised as an Empire side of the story, so let's hear more about their perspective. Does this make sense? Here's an example. In KOTOR 1, when you crash on Terrace, your goal is to find Bastila. Simple. But why? Well, because she has a powerful battle meditation ability to help the Republic. Because she could be the last hope of the Republic. Because the three of you need to escape from the Sith with your lives because Malak is chasing you. Also because she's hot. And British, too. I, that is you. Why must you be so impossibly infuriating? The reasons why you're looking for something or someone are far more interesting than what it is you're looking for. Why do you look for the Star Forge? Why is it such a deadly weapon? Why does Malak want it? And so on. Generally speaking, a story that prioritizes the why over the what is way more engaging and compelling because the plot is straightforward, but the reasoning behind everything is much more complex. I want to come with you to Alder. There's nothing for me here now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. You want to know why a character does something more than you want to know what they did. Oh, I, j I just killed some guy. O okay, why? Why did you do that? That's the Phoenix Wright games in a nutshell. My point is, for the majority of Star Wars Battlefront 2, it cares more about what's going on than it does the characters and why these things are going on. It makes it boring and hard to follow. Back to the story, you get a TIE fighter and fly up to the wreckage of the Death Star. Again, all the visuals in this game are fantastic, and it's really awesome to be able to fly through all this stuff. The space battles are also phenomenal, even if the aim assist is absurdly strong. They nailed the space combat pretty much perfectly. The Emperor is dead. So what happens now? Look, look, that's exactly what I was talking about. You have a chance for Aiden to show some emotion, and her reaction to this huge bombshell is mild surprise. Then it goes straight back to focusing on what's happening. The Empire will assault the very foundation of the rebels. You see what I'm saying? We learn this Admiral is her dad, and there's a messenger who has a final message from the dead Emperor. The blah blah blah, Operation Cinder, blah blah blah, go do some menial task. Alright, so our next mission is to get some important satellites. Come on. 
We secure the satellites. Oh. I mean, I, I was kind of hoping I'd get to do that. Next, there's another awesome space battle with a pretty cool hangar section. I just wish the game would stop taking control away from me. Do you think I'm so retarded I can't figure out how to land or take off my ship manually? More shooting, more corridors, explosions. Aiden takes off her helmet for the third time. Is it, is it just not comfortable or something? There's a tiny bit of funny banter and... Oh shit! Incoming! Boy, you could have gotten some serious brain damage there, Aiden. Are you sure it was a good idea to take your helmet off? Oh, and now it just flew out into space. Are, are you part of the special forces? Or the special forces? We get a little tidbit of Versio questioning Imperial orders and... Wait, how the fuck did you get your helmet back? Whatever. Uh, blah blah blah, Operation Cinder, blah blah blah, observatory. And then, oh yeah! R2-D2 and Luke Skywalker? This is fucking great. So you take control of Luke, you run around killing stormtroopers, and then there's a scene with Luke and Del, another member of Inferno Squad. There's some nice dialogue, and the idea of choosing your destiny is presented very well. But after this, they have the most god-awful, boring section in any first-person shooter game ever, where you kill bugs. Really. Really. We're playing as Luke Skywalker, and the coolest thing you can come up with is fucking bugs? This is atrocious. They spawn in the same locations, and you have to hold them off by spamming right trigger for five minutes. Not even fucking kidding, this goes on for five minutes. 30 seconds of this crap would have been too much. Now here's another thing to consider. This is the most awkward lightsaber combat I've ever seen in a Star Wars video game. Every time you swing the lightsaber, your character does this automatic dash, and it has this weird auto-locking mechanic. It feels like you don't really have control. Now, let me just show you what I mean firsthand. So, in the footage you're seeing, I'm gonna do a basic combo move. High, low, low, high. This is a demonstration of how the move would be handled in Battlefront 2. And this is a demonstration of how it should be. You see how one has those awkward pauses and dashes, and the other one is much more smooth, flowy, and natural? That's how it is in Jedi Academy, Classic Battlefront 2, Force Unleashed. That's the way it should be. Take it from someone who trains with weapons, alright? Anyways, the two talk about conflict, which kind of ties in with The Last Jedi if you saw that. There's still conflict in you. Of course there's conflict in me. I'm not blind. I know what the Empire is capable of, but... What else is there? A choice. The rebellion? No. A choice to be better. There's an incredibly jarring transition as Dell reappears on the Corvus and you're sent on a mission to rescue some alien. That's the Dauntless. The Dauntless? How'd that get into Star Wars? Oh, the Dauntless is the power in these waters, true enough. But there's no ship that can match the Corvus. For speed. I've heard of one. Supposed to be very fast, nigh uncatchable. The Millennium Falcon. So the Admiral plans to attack this planet Vardos because... The Emperor commands it. We'll purge this planet and others. Fear shall spread and the galaxy will remember who is in control. Is it just me or is that completely fucking retarded? Hey dipshit, if you want to remind the galaxy who's in control, then shouldn't you focus all your efforts on attacking the people responsible? You know, the rebels that just embarrassed you to the whole galaxy? Look, we all know the Empire aren't the nicest of folks, but isn't killing loyal civilians a waste of time and resources? Vardos is our target? One of them, yes. Why? The entire planet and its people, they're, they're loyal to the Empire. If you're thinking military and strategy, isn't that just a big fucking waste of time? If anything, killing these people would plant the seeds of rebellion. Oh, and it does. What a twist. And wait a second, the Emperor created this plan before his death. Then wouldn't it become irrelevant after his death and the destruction of the Death Star? What's the ultimate goal of killing civilians in the first place? Hey, that kind of looks familiar. No, your world will burn until its surface is but glass. Okay, wait, hold the fuck up. Your orders are to get this Gleb alien off planet, right? So why are you glassing it? before Inferno Squad picks her up. 
What if your glassing beams happen to kill her? Th then what? Also, why are you putting your troops on the ground in harm's way if you're attacking loyal civilians from space? I mean, ah, oh, fuck it. At this point, the formula of the campaign is pretty clear. You have a section where you walk really slowly while people talk, a stealth section, you do a space battle, on rails linear vehicle combat, and play as a hero. It's pretty boring considering the only enemies you fight in this game are infantry with the occasional vehicle. It plays like a Call of Duty campaign. You're basically a one-man army and... Oh, sorry, I meant to say you're basically a one-female army. Cause women are strong too, okay? Do you understand that? You rarely have a squad of allies backing you up, and even when you do, the battles feel pretty small. Just like the bad COD games. Rather than creating interesting scenarios or unique groups of enemies, the game just throws a bunch of stormtroopers at you. I understand the Empire is made up of stormtroopers, but why not add some type of cool bounty hunter on the side who you fight throughout the game? What about having some gigantic crate dragon that pops out of the ground, or a Rancor, Gamorians? Remember those big spider droids, Trandoshans, and all that in Republic Commando? Remember fighting those flamethrower clones, shock battle droids in Episode 3? Remember the lightsaber battles in Jedi Academy or the satisfying feeling of using force powers in the Force Unleashed? In the vast universe of Star Wars, is the only enemy type you can give us mindless infantry and fucking bugs? This is boring! Is DICE so scared of violating the canon in any capacity that they threw all the unique crazy ideas out the window in favor of a safe, generic single player? Perhaps. But as the saying goes, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Oh yeah, the AI is also fucking retarded. And it's also not a really good idea to recycle locations for the single player arcade and multiplayer. In fact, it's kinda lazy as fuck. Back to the story. Well, you're not supposed to think about why all these decisions make no sense because all it's supposed to do is give the most contrived excuse for Aiden to defect and join the rebellion. Which she does. Hooray for not fleshing out the Empire side of things at all. The Force Unleashed had a much more believable change of heart. It had build-up, timing, likable characters, motivations, destiny, and it actually made you think about things. This doesn't. We're not completely alone. Some of the crew stayed with us. Protected the refugees against those who wouldn't. Just want to know what's next. God fucking damn it, I'm so done with this already. They send out a distress signal and within like five minutes the rebels take them in. Finally I get to talk about something good in the story. Shriv. He's such a sarcastic funny guy and fits in perfectly as comic relief. So you thought it was a trap? What brought them on board anyway? You're always telling me to take risks. Seemed like the most irresponsible thing I could do. He's the type of character that would be in a Star Wars movie, and he's the best new character in this game. Honestly, the highlights of the story come from when you're playing as anyone but Aiden. They really nailed the writing and personality of Lando, Han Solo, Leia, and Luke. There's a bunch of references to the movies, and although the fan service is overwhelming at times, this is really the only reason to play the campaign. But even then, there's so many illogical leaps in story, location, and plot. Nothing really flows together naturally. It's all about shoving in as much fan service as possible without regards to how it all comes together as a complete narrative. The story of Aiden Versio is not interesting or relatable in the slightest, because her character is boring and unbelievable. I do not think a Special Forces Imperial soldier would have such a quick change of heart just because, oh no, civilians on my home. Nor do I think the Empire would attack civilians who are already loyal. It just, it just doesn't make sense. I can't suspend my disbelief. Honestly, there's not much that happens after this point that's worth discussing. It's just more fighting the Empire without much substance or greater meaning behind it. Stuff we've already seen a million times before. At the end, you go to kill Aiden's dad, but then she doesn't want to, but he dies anyway. Oh, boo-hoo. There's a badly forced romance at the end that would make Attack of the Clones proud. Some bizarre vision epilogue with Kylo Ren, and then it ends. This is basically a clear-cut example of the continuing trend in AAA games that values style over substance. Oh, it's boots on the ground combat, so it's instantly good. Oh, it's got great world design, artwork, and music, so, so it's good. The visuals and sounds are perfect, so that makes it good. 
Well, no. There's an old saying, an ugly personality ruins a pretty face. The prettiest rose will eventually wilt and gray. The reason why people love the original Star Wars movies, why people loved KOTOR, Jedi Academy, Republic Commando, why people love Star Wars, is because of the stories. The fight of good versus evil, the characters and their motivations, choosing your own destiny, light side, dark side, and everything in between. These stories are timeless. We can all connect with Luke Skywalker and empathize with his plight. We can all learn from the wise Jedi Master Yoda. We can all understand brotherhood, faith, and friendship. The whole point of the Force was to illustrate that there's more to this world than what can physically be seen. It wasn't just because of the visuals and special effects. That's not what made Star Wars good. Those help to wow the audience, and it's complementary to the story. But without any personality, a face is just a face. Graphics are just graphics. And Star Wars Battlefront 2 is just Star Wars Battlefront 2. The thing that absolutely ruins the entire game is none other than the star cards themselves. I've already covered the pay to win aspects in a previous video, links in the description for the curious. Never mind that as gamers, we've seen hundreds of games adopt loot boxes, so much that it's worn out its welcome so fast. We're just sick of fucking seeing this. It's a kiss of death for the game. Sick of being forced to open loot boxes. It's a chore. I'm tired of doing it. I'm tired of seeing all these fucking slot machines in my video games nowadays. But that's not the core issue I have, because it wasn't just EA's greed that ruined the game. It's the fact that the star cards are so integral to the game. Campaign, arcade, multiplayer, space battles, vehicles, heroes, elite classes, regular classes, cosmetic customization, progression, every single fucking thing about this game, every moment of gameplay is forced to accommodate these stupid ass cards. Fundamentally, this destroys every opportunity for creativity and innovation in the map design and gameplay. The game has to adopt a battle point system so that you can use vehicles, heroes, etc. But wouldn't it all have just been better to put vehicles on the map? Wouldn't it be way cooler to get in the MTT by simply running up to it? Isn't it more engaging to find an X-Wing or a Tauntaun on the map and use it because it's there? Wouldn't it have been better for every vehicle to have a baseline strength that doesn't change? Well yeah, all of these things were in Battlefront 2 and it made the maps feel alive. You can't pick up weapons off the map because you'd be playing with star cards you don't have. My point is you don't have any decisions after you spawn. You have to play with what you have until you die. That's boring. And it means if you want any chance of using a hero or vehicle, you have to die and get lucky and be doing well enough to have enough points. If I'm doing really well, but I want to use a vehicle, why should I be forced to commit suicide to use it? The star cards actually discourage teamwork. Again, if they made vehicles like they did in Battlefront 2, where multiple people can get into them, well, the star cards can't allow that. EA banked so hard on this system that if there was any part of it that didn't jive with the star cards, it couldn't be in the game. Look, nobody cared that back in the day, Battlefront 2 was a Star Wars version of Battlefield. In fact, that's why we loved it. But it seems like DICE is so, so intent on differentiating these two series when they don't seem to understand the basic fucking point that what made Battlefront great in the first place was it took the Battlefield formula and brought it to the Star Wars universe. How do you not understand this? The star card system also creates a huge micromanagement issue. Rather than having unique vehicles, weapons, classes, and heroes that come as they are, Instead, every player has to manage three different star cards for 38 different classes, heroes, ships, whatever. This means you have to manually choose a total of 114 star cards with four different tiers for every possible sandbox tool you can play with, alongside managing two different currencies, weapons you can modify, attachments, and relying solely on RNG to give you all this crap, it becomes a fucking nightmare. It's so much goddamn data and memorization just to understand what you're playing with. I don't care if there's a card that gives the Emperor 1% increased damage. I just want to play as the fucking Emperor. I don't care if there's a card that allows me to fire the Bowcaster 
5% slightly faster. I just want to play as a goddamn Wookiee. I don't want to have to think or care so much about the choices I make before the game that heavily affect my gameplay, my experience. So much of this is what do you do before? What crates do you open? What heroes do you buy? What do you invest your currency in? The fundamental issue here is you rely on RNG so you can't get the cards for what your playstyle is. They have different types of crates, but let's say you spend all your credits on Starfighter Assault cards. Well, this, the second you go into Galactic Assault, you're shit out of luck because you don't have any cards for that mode. Let's say you wanted all trooper cards. Well, the second you go into Heroes vs. Villains, you're fucked because you didn't spend your credits on the heroes. Do you see what I'm getting at? It's the most butt-fucking superfluous system for a game that at its core is as casual as possible. As I said, it seems like DICE doesn't want to copy anything from the Battlefield series, but what they should have done is a progression and loadout system more akin to Call of Duty and Titanfall. For whatever reason, every weapon, grenade, and ability operates on a cooldown, but wouldn't it have been far more beneficial to have some of these weapons with ammunition? Isn't it kind of bizarre to pull out a shotgun with unlimited ammo, but you can only do that every 15 seconds? Why not just give players a choice of primary and secondary weapons? Why not also give the choices of grenades, utility item, and a power ability? Ah, because they need to be attached to the star cards. Just have one ability that's on a cooldown and offer some tension in the gameplay because you can run out of ammo and items. Because even if you make a mistake with an ability, you aren't punished for it. You just wait for the cooldown. In this regard, all the weapons perform the same. Imagine if in a Halo game, every single weapon had infinite ammo, and they were all just different versions of a plasma rifle. It'd get boring as shit real fast. So if the star cards prevent you from picking up weapons, if they discourage teamwork and don't allow multi-passenger vehicles, if they force you to die to use the vehicles or things that you want, if you have to manage 114 different cards before you actually play the fucking game, if you need to memorize hundreds of different abilities and data, if it creates a system in which you aren't punished for missing your shots or wasting your grenades, if it's the type of system that incentivizes you to prioritize a single game mode that you push all your credits, cards, and currency to, then how could this star card system possibly get any worse? Well, because of scaling power. Had there been only one tier of cards, this system wouldn't be completely game-breaking. But of course, to give the loot boxes enough game-altering shit to incentivize purchases, they had to make multi-tiers. I want you to imagine you're playing Modern Warfare 2, or whatever your favorite Call of Duty game is. Remember how much time you would spend customizing your classes? That was always a highlight, right? But now imagine how fucked the Call of Duty formula would be with scaling power. Think of COD cards that would improve the base damage of the Model 1887 by 20% or any gun for that matter. Or perks that become better and better the higher tier COD cards you get. A chopper gunner that takes two more hits to take down. You try to apply this scaling power idea to the gameplay of Call of Duty and it utterly breaks the game. This idea would break any FPS game, casual or competitive. Overwatch, Halo, Titanfall 2. The idea of base skills, weapons, abilities, and vehicles that scale in power with time played or money paid is fucked up beyond belief and jeopardizes all the work that was put into this game, making it nearly unplayable for me. You might think I'm overreacting to all this star card crap, and to be honest, I probably am. But can you blame me? I wanted to love this game so badly, and they just spit in my face. At least I hope you guys understand why I'm so angry about this system. In essence, the star cards are the undoing of Battlefront 2. There is no way to fix this post-launch, because it is such an inextricable part of the game, it can't be removed or altered. EA's intent was not to provide a sense of pride and accomplishment but to provide a way for you to sink seemingly endless amounts of cash into the game. And because the star cards are such an overemphasized core component of Battlefront 2, it destroys the balance, creativity, immersion, satisfaction, tension, and fun. Well, so let's finish up with arcade and multiplayer. The arcade mode is basically just shooting the same boring enemies you were shooting in the campaign either solo with a time limit, or with AI bots in a time limit. The creativity is staggering. 
While it can be a bit of fun to try the harder difficulties, it doesn't provide enough uniqueness or fun to make it worth playing again and again. Not much to say here, it's basically a poor man's version of Firefight from the Halo games. It's fucking insulting that the game limits the amount of credits you can earn by playing it. You should understand now what I mean when I say that every part of this game had to make sacrifices to accommodate the star cards. Well, so how does the multiplayer hold up? What does it provide aside from impressive graphics and breathtaking levels? Not much. Think of every map as a different roller coaster. It's really, really fun and exciting the first time you go on it. But every time you ride it after that, it becomes less and less interesting and fun because you've already seen it and done it before. It's a spectacle, but it doesn't have depth. The maps are pretty good, but the core gameplay is so casual, it's not going to provide much of anything different from match to match. In my experience, I didn't encounter a whole lot of bugs or serious glitches, which is a good sign. Apparently, rubber banding is a huge issue for some people, but one thing I did notice was how awkward and glitchy the speeders are. They control like absolute shit. Glitches are all over the place, and sometimes it just doesn't fire. But apart from that, the game performs very well. You got 20v20 with no bots. The game can't even match the number of combatants Battlefront 2 had 12 years ago. No server browser, no private matches, no flying into capital ships and space battles, no capture the flag, and where's the hunt mode? That would have been a perfect gimmick side mode to add in. Who doesn't want to play as a Jawa, Ewok, or Tusken Raider? Uh, there's no heroes like Anakin, General Grievous, Jango Fett, Mace Windu. I don't care if these characters are going to be added later. How the fuck do you make a Star Wars game where you can play as all the different heroes and villains and not include the most pivotal character in six of the movies? Obi-Wan. The game advertised itself as incorporating all three eras, but there's only two heroes from the prequels. There's one thing I noticed about the multiplayer. So you remember in Battlefront 1 on Tatooine, there was that Sarlacc pit and the Tusken Raiders who would attack everyone? Or in Battlefront 2, there were the Jawas who would repair things on Mos Eisley, Gungans on Naboo, Ewoks on Endor. None of these factions or interesting gimmicks are on any of the maps, which is kind of a missed opportunity because they added a lot of depth and liveliness to every map. I don't know, it just makes sense that as the Rebels, you'd have Ewoks backing you up. Guess they didn't bother to program any of that stuff in. Damn shame. Again, what made Battlefront 2 and Battlefield so fun was there were several options for the player. To move around the map, to attack, defend. This time in Galactic Assault, you're basically forced to go down a series of choke points. Why is there no conquest? Where are the command posts? Or spawn points players can destroy to cut off reinforcements like the battery on Hoth? Even after all the mistakes DICE and EA made with the first game, after all the features they didn't implement there, it's like they still don't understand what we want. You gave us space battles in the Clone Wars era, and, I, and I'm so happy about that. But it just seems like you're refusing to add in the things that made the first two Battlefront games as good and popular as they were. You refuse to implement what made it possible for you to actually work and create this game and it blows my fucking mind. It offers a pretty abysmal amount of content and variety with five game modes, two of them being decent, one of them being meh, and the other two being bleh. It appears the updates will add more stuff in eventually, like every AAA shooter does these days, but nothing really stands out to me except the space battles. Though the devs talk about this idea of multiple seasons and updates that can focus on certain elements of the Star Wars universe and implement them in Battlefront 2 which I find to be a pretty neat concept. This allows new drops of content to be added with a theme, you know, fleshing out the Clone Wars or the Rebellion, etc. I just wonder how long people are willing to wait with the current content in-game. While playing multiplayer, I did notice a clone say, and that was a really nice bit of nostalgia that I appreciate. I think they nailed the voices and personality of the characters in different factions. The droid voice acting is fantastic. So at least they've artistically defined the styles of the three eras very well. All the heroes and villains are pretty satisfying to use, fun to play, and all have unique abilities and play style. Once more, the voice acting and style of the heroes is spot on. The gunplay is decent, but as I said, every weapon operates under the same cooldown mechanic, so the guns feel the same. It doesn't require a lot of thought, strategy, or teamwork. Everyone's kind of a lone wolf. I mean, it's a real casual type of game that's fun in bursts, 
However, it just doesn't seem like something that can maintain a consistent player base or keep people's attention for long. Well, in conclusion, there's not much redeeming about Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA because every single aspect of the game was compromised for star cards and loot boxes. The campaign is boring with god-awful amateur storytelling that can be finished in four hours. And the core gameplay across space battles and all the other modes is really just a visual experience, with the gameplay being pretty shallow in comparison. What I will say is the music and sound design is fantastic. Everything has a crisp Star Wars vibe to it. Guns sound powerful and just the audio and visuals are out of this world. Music of course has the good old John Williams magic to it and Battlefront 2 certainly feels like a Star Wars game. I guess what I just don't understand about these games is how they can't match what classic Battlefront 2 had. This was a huge collaborative effort between three studios and if I'm correct on my research here, then Motive Studios with 100 employees worked on the single player while Criterion Games with 90 employees worked on the vehicles and space battles, and DICE with 640 employees did everything else, alongside help and funding from Lucasfilms and EA. Now, Pandemic Studios at the time of its closure in 2009 had 228 employees, so I think it's safe to assume that EA's Battlefront 2 had a much larger budget and more hands-on deck working on it than the classic 2005 version. Which is one studio Pandemic's work still provides more content than that of a modern AAA game created by three development teams. And they didn't even have the benefit of microtransactions and free DLC and constant updates and all that crap. I just, I just don't understand. How these two companies have handled the Star Wars license is nothing short of catastrophic failure. You've pissed people off and disappointed them twice in a row after 10 years of waiting. And this is Star Wars, okay? You pieces of shit, get that through your thick skulls. This means a lot to millions of people. And if you can't treat this property, these stories, these characters, the universe that's been built up over 40 years with respect, then get fucked and fuck off. You shouldn't buy this game, but I don't mind if you already did and have fun with it. I don't have fun with it for the reasons I've just explained. And that is why Star Wars Battlefront 2 is so bad. But what do you think? Are you gonna go back and play some of these actually good Star Wars video games like I am? Well, what are your thoughts on Battlefront 2 EA? Wanna give a shout out to my boy Squeaklies for supporting the channel and all my other patrons who make it possible for me to keep making videos like this. You guys are the best, and I appreciate you. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to The Act Man for more awesome content. Alright everyone, that's all I got for today. This is The Act Man, signing out. Peace!